finish up this series, I'm going to share with you two truths. Two truths, and, and I hope they resonate with you today. And the first truth is this. I'm going to just make it plain and simple for every single one of us. Here it is. You are a bad person. Hey, hey welcome to Venue Bikers Church, where we love to encourage people. Welcome to Venue Bikers Church. We love to make you feel good about yourself. No, no, you're a bad person. <laughs> Let's just get the truth out there. Let's just, just set the baseline right there. You are a bad person. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad person. And, and so much is what is being preached in the church today. You know what it is? Self-help. It's all self-help. Oh, no. Hey, yeah. Let's just smile more. And, 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 and just believe more and just do these things more. Here's seven steps to your best life. Can I tell you one step? Jesus. Right? That's the one step. You don't need seven. I'm going to save you the time. One step. It's Jesus. You got to understand. Look at your neighbor. Say with every truth, ounce of truth you got, you're a bad person. Online. You're tuning in from online. You're a bad person. Right? You're a bad person. Let me show you in Scripture. Not my words. Let me show you in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, when you begin to study that portion of Scripture, that word filthy rags is actually what women would use during their time of the month. Yeah, so you think you're good? You think your good deeds, you think all the good deeds you do, that's what they look like in God's eyes. Filthy rags. You're thinking, you know, you're, I know what some of you are thinking, and online you're thinking, well, Rob, that's Old Testament. I'm a New Testament believer. <laughs> I'm a New Testament. Jesus, right? You said it's Jesus. Okay, let's go to the New Testament then. First John 1 verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Oh, that's in the New Testament? Yes, that's in the New Testament. That's after Jesus. Why is it you think that Paul, one of the greatest guys next to Jesus in the New Testament, the closer you, he got to God, you know what he discovered? How bad he was. To the fact where he actually began to come out and declare, I'm the chief of all sinners. The guy that wrote most of the New Testament, the closer he got to God, the realized how bad he really was how messed up he really was. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to help some of you understand you're bad. Because some of you are like, no, I'm, I'm still pretty good. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really a good person. And just because you go to church and maybe you grew up in church and you've been around church and that doesn't make you a, a good person. I love the story of the prodigal son, but sometimes we forget there's two sons in the story. And we focus on the one that kind of took his, his inheritance and went and squandered. And we're saying, that's the bad one. But there was one that was in the house that was just as lost. And we have so many believers that, you know what, they're in the house and they're lost. They're kind of going through the motions and living in the house, but they're lost. Why? Because they're believing a grayish area of truth. And then they think, well, that's good. And so I'm actually, they actually think they're okay. So Jesus actually came to this. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save bad people. Right? That, you're a bad person. That's why he came. He didn't come for good people. He came for bad people. That we are all bad apart from, like, left to our own. We are in trouble. That's how bad we are. And until you acknowledge you are a sinner, you never really understand the need for a Savior. You don't. You never really understand how bad you need a saver, Savior. And uh, I don't know if you ever heard the name Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is a, a brilliant evangelist. Uh, we've actually had the opportunity. I know, I know Chris Curry is here. He's here somewhere. Uh, Chris Curry actually worked with, with Ray Comfort. And uh, probably one of the, the most strategic street evangelists I've ever seen. Because all he would do is ask questions. <laughs> he would just ask questions to get people to realize how bad they are. Right? And so we're going to do a little test. We had the opportunity to go down to Florida and actually sit in a conference with him. And I thought, man, this guy is so brilliant the way that he does this. And he does it. It's kind of, you would say it's confrontational. But he does it in such a very respectful way. And he, he would just go. And so we're going to see how bad we really are in this place today. How many are ready to find out how bad you are? You're like, again, welcome to church. We love you. Okay. 
We're all going to respond to this. Every single one of us are going to respond. So he, he would just begin to ask questions. So how many uh, in this room, how many have ever lied? Okay. The ones that didn't put up their hands, look at them right now because they're doing it right now. Right? right? Because they're actually lying right now. Okay. So again, how many have lied? Show of hands. Look around. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. How many have ever stolen anything? Paperclip, pen from work. Right? You're like, oh, oh, okay. So where are all my thieves? Put up your hand. Oh, How many ever had a lustful thought? Your hands went up so fast. You're owning it now. You're like, yeah, they're right here. Put my legs up too, right? Okay, how, how many have ever taken the name of the Lord in vain? Oh, you were horrible. My goodness. So, in spite of all that, we all actually think we're pretty good people. We actually think we're pretty good. But in God's eyes, right? In God's eyes, how many have lied? God's eyes, you're a liar. How many have ever stole anything? God's eyes, you're a thief. How many ever had a lustful thought? You're an adulterer. <laughs> How many took the name of the Lord in vain? There's no hope for you. <laughs> right? So when we begin to understand that the, the truth is we don't compare our lives to anybody else. We line it up to God. <laughs> and we realize in God's eyes, we fall really short. Well, we fall really short. That's why I say you are a bad person. You are a bad person. Apart from Christ, you're a bad person. Now, here's the truth that I want to redeem that with. And this is an incredible truth. That you can find forgiveness and healing through Jesus. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the truth is we are a bad person, but we can find forgiveness and healing through Jesus. I promise you, I promise you with all of my heart and everything that I am, not, don't take my word for it, but what does the Bible say that you could be different in Christ? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. That's truth. That's the absolute truth. It's not you have to jump through some hoops and, and you have to go and, and, and say this many prayers and do this many good deeds. No, all you got to do is confess your sin. All you got to do, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I've been living. Would you forgive me? You know what he does? I forget about it. I forget about it. I take your sin and I throw it as far as the east is from the west to remember it no more. That there is forgiveness and healing in Jesus, only in Jesus. Right? That's the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not going to be found in anything else. It's not going to be found in going to light a candle somewhere. It's not going to be found in getting in front of a statue and, and, and meditating and humming and doing whatever you want to do in front of a statue. No, it's only found in Jesus. Period. And I love this one. When we understand our need for a Savior and how bad we really are, it leads us to this 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And this is the pattern here. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation that leaves no regrets. It leaves no regrets. You know there's no regrets in Jesus? You know how it's time when you've done something and you regret doing it? Can I tell you, when you surrender to Jesus, there's no regrets. Because when you experience true life, abundant life, when you experience forgiveness, when you experience the true freedom that's only found in Christ, you can say, why didn't I do this sooner? Why didn't I do this sooner? So godly sorrow, that's what leads us to repentance. What's godly sorrow? It's, I'm in agony of what I've done. I'm in agony of what I've done. I realize that, man, I am messed up. I'm profoundly sor sorry for what I've done. Man, my heart aches and it hurts for how wrong I've been and for how I've treated you, God. And for that, I am truly sorrow. It says godly sorrow, it brings repentance. And here's the deal. We don't have a lot of repentance in church today. 
We don't. True repentance. We have a lot of, ooh, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> ooh, God, forgive me. I, I, I know that I do this all the time, but okay, would you forgive me this time? And then we go back to doing it. That's not repentance. <laughs> That's not... Godly sorrow leads to repentance. What does repentance mean? It actually means to turn from. It actually means to turn from. And pent, that word, it actually means higher. It's where we get the word penthouse. Where's the penthouse? It's on the top. So it means to turn from the lower things of sin and turn to the higher things of God. That's what repentance means. It doesn't mean saying I'm sorry. It actually means, okay, God, you got me here. I'm, this is a mess. I, I, I'm, my heart is broken. I don't want to do that anymore. So I'm actually turning from it and I'm coming after you. That's what repentance is. Not just saying I'm sorry. Because I've seen so many believers. Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm struggling with that thing again. I'm like, again? Why don't you repent of it? Well, that means I have to leave it. And, and I, I like it there because it still provides me some pleasure. But hey, God's a merciful God and he's a graceful God. So he's always going to forgive me. So I can, I can kind of hold on to it. And, and maybe I'm not doing it every week now. Maybe I'm only doing it twice a month. And, and so it's no big deal. Right? God loves me. His, his grace is there for me. And, and that's the grayish area that we love to live. And instead of truly repenting, we say, God, I'm sorry, and we leave it there. No, no. The Bible says godly sorrow, it leads to repentance, which leads to no regrets, which leads to salvation, which leads to no regrets. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to live a life with no regrets.